Okay, good evening. Uh, can you all hear me out, out in the Shires? Yes, yes. I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay. Fine. okay, okay, thank you for attending this virtual hybrid meeting of the planning committee Thursday the 17th of December. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Council Caleb Tomlinson. I'm the chair of the committee. Also with me tonight in the in the chamber is Council Mel Donoghue, who is the vice chair. Also present with me are our officers and some members of the committee in a socially distant and COVID secure setting. This is an audio and video meeting been recorded and the stream will also be live on YouTube. The web address for this is displayed on the agenda for the meeting and can be found on the Council's website. If you've joined the meeting because you're a member of the public who has registered to speak, please note you have a time limit of up to four minutes. Please unmute your mic when I invite you to speak. And the Shared Legal Services Team Leader Taz will operate a stopwatch and will confirm when your time runs out. You should then finish or in the middle of making a point, wind up within a few seconds and finish speaking. After each report has been presented and any speakers have made their representations, I will bring the application into committee. If any committee members wish to speak on an application, you should unmute your microphone and use the chat function in the top right hand corner to notify our moderator that you wish to speak. I will then invite you in in order. Taz will repeat the motion before the vote is taken to ensure everyone is aware of what is being voted on. I will call each member alphabetically to vote and Taz will confirm the outcome of the decision. As a consequence of the adjournment of the meeting on the 10th of December, the two agendas have been combined. We will deal with the five applications that were to be considered last week, which have been published in a supplementary agenda for this meeting. The technical issues of last week have now been resolved but if the technology does fail, I'll adjourn the meeting until a satisfactory time can be found. Uh, please can I ask all members to confirm they can see, hear and speak before the meeting begins. I will call you alphabetically. Councillor Adams. Loud and clear, Chair. Councillor Donoghue. Yes, Chair. Councillor James Flannery. Yes, Chair. Councillor Mary Green. Yes, Chair. Councillor Harry Hancock. Clear, Chair. Councillor Mick Higgins. Councillor Christine Melia. Yes, Chair. Councillor Council Caroline Moon. Yes, Chair. Councillor Phil Smith. Yes, Chair. Councillor Gareth Watson. Yes, Chair. Councillor Barry Yates. Yes, Chair. And our officers, Jonathan Node. Yes, Chair. Dave Whelan. Yes, Chair. Taz Safdar. Yes, Chair. Catherine Lewis. Yes, Chair. Chris Sowerby. Yes, Chair. Linda Ashcroft. Linda Ashcroft. All right, OK. Janice Crook. Yes, Chair. Debbie Roberts. Yes, Chair. And Charlotte Lynch. Yes, Chair. Okay, do we have any apologies for absence? Chair, we have no apologies for absence. Okay, thanks for that. Do we have any declarations of interest? Yes, Chair. Councillor Hancock. Okay, Councillor Hancock. It's the Pemberley the Marts uh, Centre, the venue, a personal interest as a member of the Pemberley Town Council and a ward member. That's not a prejudicial interest, is it? No, it's no, not. No, chair. No, 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 Chair, it's just a personal. Okay, do we have we read the minutes of the last meeting? And can I have someone move them? Council, Council Smith, thank you, seconded. Thank you, Councillor Higgins. Okay, so we need to take a vote on that. Councillor Adams? Yes, Chair. Councillor Donoghue? Uh, yes, Chair. Councillor Flannery? Yes, Chair. Councillor Mary Green? Yes, yes Chair. Chair. Councillor Harry Hancock? Yes, yes Chair. Councillor John Hesketh? Yes, yes, Chair. Councillor Mick Higgins? Yes, Councillor Christine Melia? Yes, yes, Chair. 
Councillor Phil Smith. Yes, Chair. Councillor Gareth Watson. Yes, Chair. And finally, Councillor Barry Yates. Yes, Chair. Do we have any appeal decisions? None to report, Chair. Okay, thanks for that, Jonathan. Okay, item number seven, land to the rear of Oak Dean, Chain House Lane, White Stake. Um, if Catherine would present the report, please. Thank you, Chair. The application is for um, 100 dwellings with all matters reserved, uh, save the access, and it's located over a kilometre from Lostock Hall, and it's to the south of Chain House Lane. The next slide is an aerial view. The application site comprises agricultural fields, about 3.6 hectares, um, with access taken from the northern boundary on Chain House Lane, and the southern boundary is partly where the re railway embankment is. There's a bungalow on the western boundary, and Oak Dean is surrounded on three sides by the proposal. The planning committee may remember that they refused a similar application in June 2019. A public inquiry was held in November 2019, and the planning inspector dismissed the appeal. The applicant submitted a challenge to the High Court, known as a judicial review, a JR challenge, about the lawfulness of the decision made by the planning inspectorate. South Ribble sought to defend the challenge as an interested party, but failed on one of the five grounds. And ultimately, the judgment from the High Court was down to the Government Planning Inspector not interpreting an element of policy correctly. And that element of policy related to the distribution of the housing requirement that would result from the application of the standard method within the housing market area. And we'll kind of come back to that later. The public inquiry will be reconvened in March 2021 to reconsider the earlier planning application. The next three slides are going to demonstrate the um, uh, application and the site boundaries. This slide shows looking west towards Chain House Lane with the application site on, on the left hand side of the slide. The next slide is looking east on Chain House Lane and you can see Oak Dean uh, property here which the application site uh, surrounds on three sides. And then this slide looks north on Church uh, Lane um, with the application site on the left hand side and you've got the bus stops uh, related here that um, Lancs County Council Highways, if the application were to be approved, would require some updating. This slide demonstrates the local plan designation. The site is allocated in the local plan under policy G3, safeguarded land for future development. The text to the policy makes clear that the land remains safeguarded within the plan period. Planning permission will not be granted for development, which would prejudice potential longer term comprehensive development of the land. So in terms of this application, the key questions are, does the proposal comply with policy G3 of the local plan? Can the council demonstrate a five year housing supply? Are the most important policies within the local plan out of date? and whether there are any adverse impacts which significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits of the proposal. And then finally, whether or not there are any material considerations to justify the proposed development on safeguarded land at this time. The next slide uh, demonstrates an illustrative master plan. Yes, the application is in outline form, but the applicant has provided this plan to demonstrate the 100 dwellings. It demonstrates elements of open space, the vehicular access point and pedestrian links onto Chain House Lane and Church Lane. The scheme utilises the existing field boundaries. There have been no objections from any statutory consultees. The Ecology Service, um, as a verbal update, have confirmed that they too are not objecting. However, the planning inspector, when dismissing the appeal for the previous application, accepted a number of important points which officers consider are still relevant to this application. The planning inspector accepted the council's assessment 
that the location of the site is at a distance from the existing urban area. The inspector acknowledged that this would create a disconnected pocket of housing which would not establish a strong sense of place. National planning policy is very clear about planning decisions and they should ensure that the development optimises the potential of the site. As this application is part of a larger site currently safeguarded, the lack of comprehensive development was a concern for the inspector too. National policies make clear that the planning system should be genuinely plan-led with local plans providing a platform for local people to shape their surroundings. The inspector noted that South Ribble has a strong commitment to master plans for larger sites and, it, and noted that there had not been effective community engagement as part of a master plan process and therefore failed to understand the local community and any potential aspirations. The inspector acknowledged that there were benefits to the scheme. It assisted in boosting the government's objective of boosting the supply of homes, including 30% affordable housing. There were economic benefits during construction, additional council tax revenue, public transport contributions, cycle parking contributions. Many are generic, no more than any other major builder uh, would provide on sites and therefore limited positive weight was given to those, concert, those um, benefits. Moderate weight was given to the provision of open market housing and significant benefit was afforded to the affordable housing element. But that planning inspector concluded that the benefits do not address the fundamental issue of the site's location within safeguarded land and the harm which would result from the prejudice to potential longer term comprehensive development of the land. So turning to this application, there's been a change in circumstances since the previous application was presented to the planning committee. South Ribble is one of three authorities which form the central Lancashire core strategy. The housing requirement in the core strategy at policy four provides for 417 dwellings per annum for South Ribble and that has been considered out of date. The introduction of the standard method for housing as the basis on which housing requirements should now be based by central government means that South Ribble has a requirement of 191 dwellings per annum. In the light of the High Court judgment, policy G3 is technically out of date but still is considerable weight. The tilted balance is therefore engaged. So what does that mean? It requires a balancing exercise of the application as planning permission should be granted unless any adverse impacts would significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits. So does the proposal amount to a sustainable form of development with reference to the housing supply and the comprehensive development of the area? Again, there are benefits to the scheme and it would assist in boosting the government's objective uh, of the supply of homes, including 30% affordable. There are again economic benefits during construction, the community infrastructure levy payments and the additional council tax revenue. There would be the benefit of the public transport contribution and cycle parking contributions. But again, the majority are generic, generic, no more than any other major builder and therefore, as officers, limited positive weight is given to those aspects. Moderate weight is attached to the provision of open market housing and there's significant benefit to the affordable housing provision. However, the council can demonstrate a five year housing supply of deliberate sites using the standard method. The supply is healthy around 13 years and the weight attached to the delivery of more market housing is significantly reduced. The application site is allocated as safeguarded for future development through policy G3. Substantial weight should be attached to that aspect. The proposal does not constitute sustainable development. It is still a disconnected pocket of housing away from the major urban site. There are no material considerations that to justify the conflict with the development plan that do not justify the conflict with the development plan. And there would be harm in terms of the ability of the council 
to manage the comprehensive development of the area if one small area were to be approved. And therefore, the application is recommended for refusal as set out in the report. Thank you, Chair. OK, thanks, Catherine. I have four registered objectors and I will take them in order. Um, the first one being Jean Berry. Good evening, Chairman and Committee. Good evening. I'm Jean Berry of School Lane, Lostock Hall. I'm also speaking on behalf of 413 members of Say No to Chain House Lane and 141 local residents who are not members. We set up a new online petition for this application and we have 1,276 signatures. Because of COVID, we do not have any written petition. We would like to thank the planning officer for putting together a comprehensive report and hope that you will continue to support her recommendation. This land is safeguarded under policy three and is not included within the South Ribble plans. The documents submitted are from 2018 and 19 and the duplicate of previous application. However, the ecology report surveys which were carried out in July 2018, have been, um, we've, we've had a new document, 48 pages long, was submitted on the 2nd of December. There was apparently a site visit last month and the rest are desktop surveys. I feel this is questionable. A large percentage of objectors raised the issues of traffic and travel the transport document from 2019 includes a traffic survey carried out on the 18th of October 2018, over 24 hours, when schools were closed or half day due to half term. LCC stated on the 28th of January 2018, based on existing vehicle movements along Chain House Lane, it is not acceptable the trip distribution needs to be more robust, i.e. the use of a census data. There was an estimated additional 1,731 residents in South Ribble mid-2019. Therefore, the 2011 census figures are out of date and can't give a true reflection of traffic movement. The modelling does not take into account HGVs that frequently block Chainhouse Lane within feet of the proposed access point. Peak times traffic is usually backed up from the A582 past the access point of the site onto Church Lane and Coote Lane. Accidents in the wider area brings chaos for hours in our area and total gridlock. I question the accident figures. In the, in the first document, it stated there was two accidents between 2013 and 17. It was later amended to no accidents. A police FOI in 2019 for the same period had a total of 41 accidents on Chainhouse Lane, Coote Lane and Church Lane. Not all accidents are recorded by the police. To carry out infill to higher the ground level as proposed, HGV vehicles carrying approximately 20 tonnes per journey would amount to around 4,850 HGV trips. This doesn't include additional infill due to earth compaction. The travel plan from 2019 is now out of date with the bus services no longer in existence one service is running Monday to Saturday from 6.25 to 8 p.m. between Preston Leyland and Chorley. No service on a Sunday or bank holiday. It has to be hailed to stop on Chainhouse Lane or Church Lane. It does not go into Ch Lostock Hall where the railway station and other services are. It is not a dependable service due to the congestion in Preston Leyland and Chorley. Chair, that's four minutes. Can I just finish? Yeah, uh, Jean, you, pre you presented very well. If you could tie up now, please. Yes, th thank you. This site would be isolated and during periods of inclement weather, residents would therefore continue to use their cars. I have too many points to put before you in four minutes and thank you for listening. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thanks for presenting, Jean. Thank you very much. 
Uh, we now have Michael Collison. Good evening, Chairman and members of the committee. I am Michael Collison of Brook Lane. My property overlooks the field stretching from Brook Lane to Church Lane. I wish to object and explain why we feel there is no housing crisis and no need to use land that is under the protection of the G3 policy and is not in the local plan. Also about our concerns about air pollution. The new Schla of 2019-2020 on page 17 shows over 13 years of deliverable dwellings. An FOI request states on the 17th of November that 491 dwellings are registered as unoccupied for six months or more. Nationally, there's almost 270,000 homes. The new government, government housing supply document was published on the 26th of November. Mr. Jenrick tweeted this had been the single biggest ever increased in net additions in 30 years. On page eight of the Schla, it shows 237 dwellings have been completed in Farrington, Leyland and Whitestake, with 430 dwellings completed in the borough. Approximately 55% of the, these completions fall within our local area. On page four, it states that there is permission, sorry, there are permissions for a further 3,617 dwellings. It is anticipated that there will be further windfall dwellings brought forward, which will increase these figures. An MOU agreement between Central Lanks was signed on the 13th of May. South Ribble was to supply 328 homes per year. Now, apparently, Preston wishes to withdraw from the agreement, so South Ribble would revert to the standard mythology and would only need to supply 191 new homes per year to meet the, requ the requirements. But if bound by the MOU figures, we would still have enough housing to meet the five-year requirements. Within a five-mile radius of PR44LE, Zoopla ho uh, lists some 1,548 homes for sale and 857 for rent. The Central Lanks issues an operate options consultation for planning in the future held in February. Submissions were made for this land to be protected. The application is for 3.6 hectares. However, at the appeal last year for this development, a master plan was presented showing the area from Church Lane to Brook Lane covered in houses. If this application was passed, then I'm sure there'd be an application presented from Homes England, which could amount to around an additional 400 dwellings. In regards to air pollution, it is recognised as a contributing factor in life-threatening uh, diseases, especially to the vulnerable. Uh, in 2019, research for premature deaths due to poor air quality in the UK amounted to 64,000. In 2005, there were four AQMAs and an additional AQMA was added in 2017. There have been specific issues raised around the Whitfire site. With prevailing winds in the right direction, it would affect the development. Standing traffic at peak times and movements from HG HGVs from surrounding businesses will also add to pollution. Vehicles will continue expelling NO2 and other particulate matter, including PM10 and PM2.5 expelled from tyres and brakes from electric and hybrid cars. The true cost of the climate may show there are greater issues in production of the batteries and electrical supplies for electric cars. With living close to the area, in these past few weeks, I've had in my garden buzzards, owls, foxes and sheep, as well as the usual wildlife, including bats and the odd deer in the fields. OK, Michael. Um that's your four minutes, if yep. you can tie up now, please. I can confirm that in times of heavy rainfall, the field and my garden is usually flood flooded. Thank you for listening. OK, thanks for presenting. Uh, do we have Joanna O'Connor? Good evening, Chairman and members of the committee. Good evening. I'm Joanna O'Connor of Coot Lane, and I'm here today to object to how accepting this planning application will constitute unnecessary overdevelopment on a safeguarded land site. I also object to how this development would irreparably and irrevocably change the rural character and upset the balance of biodiversity in an area presently used for agriculture. The proposed plan conflicts with policy G17, the design criteria for new development. The nature of the proposed design will have a detrimental impact on the neighbouring buildings and it will significantly change the character of an area from being an important agricultural site 
to a built up area that overshadows and overbears the existing properties in the area. The campaign to protect rural England identifies farming and agriculture as an industry in danger of being irreplaceably destroyed. And it warns that once green fields are gone, they're gone forever. And therefore such meadows require immediate protection from our local council. The National Pol Planning Policy Framework states that pursuing sustainable development involves seeking positive improvements in the quality of the natural environment. One of the core principles stated in the National Planning Policy Framework in paragraph 8c states its environmental objective is to contribute to protecting and enhancing our natural built and historic environment, including making effective use of land, helping to improve biodiversity and using natural resources prudently and minimising waste and pollution and mitigating and adapting to climate change. I'm concerned that the removal of trees and hedgerows on this proposed site directly contradict the objectives of this framework and I feel this site should be protected under the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981. The development, developers also proposed to remove sections of hedgerows um, within the site, despite them being identified as priority habitats in the Hedgerows Regulations 1997. One of the hedgerows, number seven within the site, you have the photo in the ecology survey assessment, is identified as important from these regulations. There's a mixture of hedgerows within the site. There's a list, 22H, 19H, 24H, 28G, 5H and 23H. And these include hawthorn, blackthorn, rosebriar, elderflower, um, osier and goat willow. And all of these support a huge variety of bugs, insects, birds and bats. The hawthorn alone has been noted by the Woodland Trust as supporting over 300 species, providing food for caterpillar moths, such as the hawthorn moth and lappet moths, and feeding migrating birds, such as thrush and other small mammals, such as hedgehogs which are obviously in decline, in part due to a loss of their habitat due to building developments. They also provide nesting shelter for many bird species and provide important pollen and nectar for bees and other pollinators. Uh, the goat willow is the main food supply for the purple emperor butterfly, who lay their eggs in the goat willow to overwinter and pupate in the summer. And over the 20th century, there's been a steady decline of the purple emperors, in part due to their loss of habitat in the UK. Clearly, the removal of any of these existing hedgerows will have a significant detrimental impact, impact on the existing wildlife. And disruption and removal of these hedgerows will irreparably, irreparably damage the current balance of the local ecosystems. And there are no proposals in the plans of to enhance ecological um, environment or opportunity to improve or increase biodiversity in the area. Joanna, that's four minutes. Thank you. All of these directly contradict the National Planning Policy Framework environmental objective as outlined earlier. Thank you for listening. Yeah, thanks for presenting. Do we have Elaine Robb? Yes, Chair, thank you, um, committee members. My name is Elaine Robb and I want to object to the application on the grounds I believe it will increase the risk of surface water flooding in the area. There are a number of points that concern me regarding the flood risk and drainage assessment which has been submitted in support of the application for the site. National Planning Policy Framework clearly states local planning authorities should adopt proactive strategies to mitigate and adapt to climate change taking full account of flood risk, coastal change, water supply and demand consideration. I believe this application fails to fully consider the flood risk to existing residents. The methodology used by the developers to collate their flood risk assessment was a desk-based approach. Based on this rationale, they have stated they will raise the levels of the site by 1.5 metres and incorporate underground attenuation so that the proposed properties would, won't be at significant risk of flooding from runoff from adjacent land. We've already heard um, the number of increase in the heavy goods vehicles this would require, obviously impacting the air quality. Um, having been a local resident on Coot Lane for 16 years, I can personally attest to the flooding that has taken place in the vicinity of the proposed site. 
and in the wider surrounding area. I believe this desk-based plan will exacerbate the existing wat surface water flooding and detrimentally impact existing residents and their properties. Photographic evidence of local flooding was provided by local residents for the original application. Taken over a number of years, it clearly demonstrates this is not a one-off unusual occurrence. There is no confidence from local residents that this development will not detrimentally affect the properties from surface water runoff. There is also concern about water, surface water being drained into Mill Brook, which is prone to overflowing during periods of persistent rainfall. Um, the Environment Agency Flood Warning Information Service on the map clearly shows the field areas behind the proposed site in some parts at high risk of surface water flooding. Network Rail clearly stated in the response document, the applicant must ensure that the proposal drainage does not increase network rail liability or cause flooding, pollution or soil slippage vegetation or boundary issues on railway land. Should Mill Brook not have the capacity to contain the surface water from the site, the risk for the, the fields at the rear of the site to flood is increased. These fields are directly below the railway embankment. The geo-environmental death study completed in August 2018 identifies large clay deposits which would not allow the surface water to soak away naturally. And we've already heard from a local resident on the lane how his garden and the fields flood. I would really urge this committee to continue to support local residents by taking account of the genuine concerns and objections raised and based on the experience and the photographic evidence that have been provided with the original objections. Um, for this development and continue to support uh, the residents by rejecting this proposal this evening. I would also like to thank the immense amount of work by the officers. That's four, minute, four minutes, yeah. Elaine. Just okay, thanks. To say, thanks to the officers for their support in the past. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for presenting. Okay, I have two members of the council not on committee wishing to speak. Uh, firstly, the Ward Councillor, Mrs Karen Walton. Thank you, Chair, and good evening, everyone. I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the residents of the Farrington West Ward, but especially the residents who live in the areas of Chainhouse Lane, Coote Lane, Church Lane and Crosston Road, to object to this application. And this isn't the first time I've spoken to represent my residents over the outline planning application for the 100 houses um, off Chainhouse Lane including the public inquiry in November 2019. The National Planning Framework states that a new development should be appropriate for its location and yet Section G3, a very relevant and important policy, identifies land in the borough to be safeguarded from development and not required if enough land is identified elsewhere to meet the borough's housing development numbers, which using the standard method of calculation this Council has demonstrated tonight there is a sufficient and five year and more supply of housing sites in the borough. Section G3 also identifies safeguarded land will remain in existing use and be kept free from new development until the local plan is reviewed, which is actually taking place at this moment in time. In my opinion, this site would seriously undermine the council's ability to manage the future developments of house building in the area and create an isolated and disconnected pocket of housing to be detrimental to the long-term development of sites already allocated for development in this area. This development, as, as shown tonight, would be an ad hoc development and undermines the local planning process. There are a number of large housing developments allocated in the surrounding areas, especially of Farrington West, which already has a large share of, of new housing developments. So there is a greater need to comply with Section G3 to ensure that green belt boundaries and safeguarded land, which creates green lungs between the large housing developments, so ensuring the permanence of the green belt so badly needed 
in this area of the borough. Chainhouse Lane is a rural single lane carriageway extending west about 160 metres to the A582 Pemberton Way and east onto Coote Lane over a single lane weight limited railway bridge. The speed limit varies from 20 to 40 miles per hour on the footways along the road and they vary from one no footpath on one side to narrow paths on the other side of the road. The proposed access site on Chain House Lane would have a considerable detrimental effect on existing and new residents. The duelling of the A582 is crucial to any more developments in the area, as at peak times the area is subject to a high volume of often idling or standing traffic at the junction of the A582 and, in my opinion, the congestion and delays experienced daily by users of the narrow rural roads and with the impact of 100 new dwellings would have, again, a considerable de detrimental effect on the capabilities and safety capacity of these local rural roads. Future residents of the proposed development would probably predominantly use cars to travel to and from the areas of Lost Hall and Tardigate to access schools, health services, shops and the railway station and it is also the preferred route to the M6 motorway, avoiding the traffic hold-ups every day on the A582, causing a, a rat run and an increase in traffic through the already heavily congested areas. The potential exposure of ex existing and future residents if the proposed site would have an, a significant impact on the air quality in the area where we live. Although the site is not subject to an air quality management um, order, but according to the developers, is 1.5 kilometres from an existing. Council Walton, that's four minutes. Sorry. Sorry. According to recent definite figures, the area has the highest levels of nitrogen peroxide in the borough. The developers have set out a strategy to encourage future residents to use public transport. As we've said before, it's only one bus, no buses on a Sunday, and they don't come through lost a call. Help, so there will be an, an increase. Um, okay, Councillor Walton, I'm going to I'm going to have to stop you now. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to ask the planning committee to support the refusal of this planning application. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for presenting. Thank you very much. Uh, I now have Councillor Michael Green, who is a neighbouring ward councillor. Councillor Green. Good. E Good evening, Chairman. Um, can I first of all begin, begin by thanking the officers, um, particularly Catherine Lewis, um, for, for the work on this application and for a balanced um, but very um, excellent um, presentation this evening. And I, I speak to oppose this development, um, which in my view does not constitute sustainable development. The, the application is not supported, uh, Chairman and colleagues, by, by adequate services and infrastructure such as schools, medical facilities, highways and footways. This will clearly have an impact upon the residents of Farrington, but beyond that into the neighbouring wards. The proposed development would adversely impact upon air quality and congestion for the local residents. This would also adversely impact upon the residents of my ward who travel through Farrington to get to Preston and to most of the motorway junctions. I therefore agree wholeheartedly with the officer recommendations regarding this proposal. It is not sustainable, colleagues, and is not appropriate for this location. I would therefore strongly urge councillors to reject the application this evening. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Councillor Green. Okay, that's all members of the public and all members of the council not on committee. I will now bring this into committee. Councillor Flannery. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, this won't take me long. Thanks, Catherine Lewis, for an excellent report, um, consistent excellence. Well, spell that's set out with all the issues which we need to consider. So you've helped us considerably. And then thank you to the residents, Jean, Michael, Joanna and Elaine. So the, your research and what you presented in terms of your objections tonight was excellent. Uh, the developer could probably do with speaking to you a little bit more, um, personally speaking. Um, but whilst we welcome sensitive and well-designed developments in South Ribble, we welcome this with full consultation with our residents 
and we've heard our residents speak tonight. We've also heard um, Councillor Karen Walton also, and Councillor Green also speaking on behalf of the residents. Um, but the issue really is, um, once again, we've got a situation which we see in the committee, whereas the people and residents of our communities are prepared to take the time and effort to present the case and we don't have the developer in the room, which is not a good sign for us in terms of what we were, were, were looking to, the standards we set here. Um, we won't accept that, to be fair. Um, so really, when you look at the balance of what we're looking considering here this evening, safeguarded land means safeguarded land. Um, the officer's report is refusal. Therefore, I propose refusal uh, as per this application reference to policy G3 the South River Borough Plan. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Councillor Flannery. Councillor Will Adams. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, just to echo the, the points about the developer not bothering to turn up, I think it says everything um, that it needs to. Um, thank you, first of all, to the residents who spoke so passionately about your community and your concerns in your area. Um, and also thanks to the officers for such a compre comprehensive report. I think it's made a decision quite easy tonight, to be honest. Um, while I don't agree with the comments stating that we don't have a housing crisis within the country, I cannot and will not accept or approve unsustainable development within South Rural. For all these reasons and the reasons set out already in the report and by Councillor Flannery, I'm happy to second refusal for this application. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Councillor Adams. Uh, Councillor Barry Yates. Right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, everything's been said, really, so it's been proposed, been seconded. Uh, I'd like to thank Catherine for another excellent report. I'd like to thank all the residents. Uh, that was, uh, I can say, was did all the work. It took it took everything away from the committee. It uh, it put down everything that I was thinking, and I'd like to say a special. Thank you to Councillor Carol, Karen Walton uh, for her outstanding work in this that she's been doing. Uh, uh, it's been, I think it's been months, if not years, uh, on the situation around this area. So thanks very much for that, Karen. Um, and I agree with the proposals. Thanks, Councillor Yates. Councillor Mary Green. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, basically this application um, is determined with the fact that it's safeguarded land. Um, contrary to policy G3, which you can sta see well stated on page 25 and page 35, clearly states the uh, policy of the local plan and South Ribble. And obviously it, it uh, countermands anything from the developer might put forward. So I've noted that it's a very comprehensive report this evening by the residents and obviously the officers, Catherine Lewis especially. You can see she's done an immense amount of work on this, this issue. Um, and I thank them all for all the work. All the evidence in this report that I've heard and leads me to, to agree with the recommendation and therefore will be voting refusal this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Green. Councillor Phil Smith. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, I obviously will be voting against this uh, for the, the reasons stated by the, the officers uh, within the report. Uh, the reasons are very valid, I have to say. Um, we've all spent a long time reading from page 9 to 123, which uh, um, is a bit of an effort in the sense that a lot of it's legal jargon. Um, but I, I'm just wondering, the, 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 the presentations by the, um, the, the residents that live there and, and the councillors, um, are there any other reasons that could be added to this for refusal? No, um, we don't need to. Hmm? We don't need to, Councillor Smith. I, I, I know we don't need to. I, I understand that. Uh, but are there any I'll, other I'll reasons? i for you. Yeah. Uh, can I just finish? And are there any other reasons that the residents have mentioned that could be added to the report for refusal? Might be a difficult question. I realise that, but 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Councillor, for the question. Uh, your officer advice would be not to come up with any more reasons for refusal. <clears throat> All the statutory consultees have raised no objection. The concerns are noted by the residents, and a lot of those concerns are because <coughs> it's a small part of a larger site. So things like the flooding could be potentially looked at as part of a larger site but the principle of the development is one that we have enough housing and this is safeguarded. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. I understand that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I am fine. Right, so do we have any other members on committee wishing to speak or make a, an alternative proposal? Okay, we'll go to the vote then, I think. Taz, can you explain what the vote is. Bear with me, Chair. So, um, members will be voting on refusing um, the application in respect of uh, outline permission for up to 100 dwellings with access and associated works at land at rear of the Oak Dean. Okay. Okay, thanks for that, Taz. So, I will now call out each member alphabetically. Councillor Will Adams. Four. Four refusal. Refusal, Chair. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Adams. <laughs> Councillor Mal Donoghue. Yeah, same reason, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Flannery. Four refusal. Councillor Mary Green. Refusal. Councillor Harry Hancock. Refusal. Councillor John Hesketh. For, for refusal, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Councillor Hesketh. Councillor Mick Higgins. Refusal, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Higgins. Councillor Christine Melia. For refusal. Thank you. Councillor Caroline Moon. For. Councillor Phil Smith. For refusal. Councillor Gareth Watson. For refusal, Chair. Refusal. Councillor Barry Yates. Refusal, Thanks, Councillor Yates. And I am also for refusing this application. Taz, can you give us the vote? So that's a unanimous vote for refusal of the application, Sir Chair. Okay, thanks very much for that. Okay, item number eight on tonight's agenda, 5 East Square, Longton. And I'd like to invite Catherine Lewis to present this report. Thank you, Chair. The application is for the erection of a detached two-storey dwelling with access off Longcroft. Um, the first slide demonstrates uh, the location of the site. It will be located in the garden areas of number 5 and 6 East Square. So the area in red is the application site and the two properties 5 and 6 are here. And access will be taken from Longcroft, which is to the north of the site. The next slide demonstrates the site plan of how a um, proposed two-storey dwelling would sit within the site. The three car parking spaces located here with access from Longcroft, but the site is within this garden area. The next two slides demonstrate the elevations. The dwelling would have an asymmetrical roof of 8.3 metres in height to the ridge and a minimum of 4 metres to 4.9 metres. It would be render stonework and charcoal cladding and would have a grey slate effect to the roof. And then the next slide demonstrated the properties known as five and east square here. And then this is the area that's the subject of the application that is the garden areas. Although there's no boundary treatment to the garden areas, this forms the garden area for each one of them. And then the next, next slide shows the proposed access, which is at the head of Longcroft. And Longcroft is a, a, a cul-de-sac with a mix of property types. Some are semi-detached. And the next slide demonstrates there are some bungalows as well adjacent. And that's number east. Uh, sorry, that's number five, Longcroft. And the next two slides uh, demonstrate the views into the site. And again, this is the garden area that you can see that forms part of the application. And this is taken from number five, Longcroft, uh, and the garden area, and this is the bungalow on the other side as well. 
And then the final slide has been provided by um, one of the residents who's expressed concern about the development which will be taken from the head of the cul-de-sac here and how her car would be able to access the side of her property. However, Lanks County Council Highways have raised no objection. Two site notices were posted and a total of 21 neighbours have been notified. 16 letters of objection have been received from the neighbouring properties, but there's been no objections from any of the statutory consultees. But it's considered that the relationship of the boundary treatment of the garden area to number five and six would appear an incongruous feature in the street scene and concern is also raised about the impact of the proposal on the occupiers of number five Longcroft and number six East Square. So that the scale and siting of the dwelling would have a detrimental impact upon the residential uh, properties by undue loss of private amenity space, privacy, overshadowing and would appear overbearing. The application is therefore recommended for refusal. Thank you, Chair. OK, thanks for that, Catherine. Um, we do have registered speaker, uh, Susan Fox. Yes. Good evening, Chair. Good evening. Councillors and uh, members of staff. Um, the proposed planning application for a detached d dwelling would have an adverse impact um, in terms of its design, height and scale, both in East Square, where the existing dwellings are semi-detached, and also in, sorry, and also in Longcroft, where the existing dwellings are bungalows and semi-detached dwellings. As the planning officer Can states in her report, this, sorry, this constitutes a breach of policy G17, especially relating to 60 square and five Longcroft, in addition to appearing overbearing from neighborhood gardens. Um, I would therefore like to re request the committee to endorse the report of a planning officer, which I thought was very detailed. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, David Whelan. Yeah, sorry, Chairman, it's just um, something I just wanted to check. In the introduction to the report, it says the application is brought before committee because the applicant is related to a member and an elected member. Could I just clarify who the elected member is, if we know that? I'm just checking they're not on planning committee, mm. in which case an interest should have been declared. Sorry, Chair, uh, I don't know who the elected member is. If I, if I could just ask the members of committee whether, if, if any of the members of the committee are, are um, related to this applicant, then clearly they should be declaring at least some kind of interest. Okay, are any members of the committee related to the applicant? Okay, thanks. Thank you all for that. Um, I have the Ward Councillor, Councillor Colin Clark. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I can. Um, can I? Can I just? Can I just stop? I'll, I'll come back to you, Councillor Clark. J Councillor Hesketh, you've raised your hand. Yeah. Sorry, I did. It, yeah, Councillor Hesketh, you, your hands raised. Yes. Well, can I speak now, or? Oh, certainly, of course you can. Right, right. I, th I thought Councillor Clark was speaking first. Uh, no, as far as I'm concerned, Mr. Chairman, this no would not fit in with the street scene. It, it, yeah, it okay. Uh, I'm sorry, Councillor Hesketh, I'm going to have to interrupt you now. Councillor Clark, can you come in and give us your objections, please? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Members of the committee, this application has given rise to severe stress and mental anxiety amongst the members affected by this proposal, proposed development. Some years ago, the council became concerned about the proliferation of applications for housing development in the gardens of existing properties across the borough. As a consequence, a policy was established to safeguard the interests of existing properties from this particular activity. And in my opinion, this proposal represents the worst example of garden grabbing that I've ever seen. If approved, it would have a severe detrimental impact 
upon the surrounding properties in terms of amenity, character, appearance, environmental quality and most of all privacy. Moreover, it would be incompatible with the area. I commend the planning officer Linda Ashcroft uh, on an excellent report which contains a recommendation for refusal with very relevant planning reasons which accord with the planning policy G7 of the local plan. I urge the committee to make its decision commensurate with that recommendation. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Do we have Councillor Colin Coulton? Thank you, Chair. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, our officer, Linda Ashcroft, for all the help she's given us. Uh, she's been excellent, particularly with me. I found her really, really helpful. Thank you. Uh, I can't really add to uh, what's the comments uh, of the, uh, the member of public and also Councillor Colin Clark. So I would urge you to agree with our officer's uh, recommendation and refuse this application. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Colton. OK, I will now bring this into committee. Councillor Hesketh. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I'll start again. Uh, it wouldn't fit in with the street scene as far as I can see, Mr Chairman. It's certainly overdevelopment and uh, it would also have impact on local uh, properties. And now we'll go along with the officer's recommendation for refusal, Mr Chairman. Thank you. OK, thank you, Councillor Hesketh. Councillor Phil Smith. I well, should be brief, Chair. It's a, an appalling application, this. If you've ever been down there and looked at it, um, I will second the uh, proposal for refusal. OK, thanks for that, Councillor Smith. So we've got a proposal and a seconder for refusal. Do we have any other proposals? Anybody else wishing to speak on this item? No? OK, we'll go to the vote. Uh, Councillor Will Adams. For refusal, Chair. Councillor Mal Donoghue. For refusal. Councillor James Flannery. For refusal. Councillor Mary Green. Refusal, Chair. Councillor Harry Hancock. Refusal, Chair. Councillor John Hesketh. Refusal, Chair. Councillor Mick Higgins. Refusal, Chair. Councillor Christine Muria. For refusal, Chair. Councillor Caroline Moon. Oh. Councillor Phil Smith. For refusal. Councillor Gareth Watts. For refusal, Chair. Councillor Barry Yates. Refusal, Chair. I am also in favour of refusal. Taz, can you give us the vote, please? Yes, Chair. It's not a unanimous um, vote in respect of refusal for this application. OK, thanks very much for that. Uh, item number nine. Uh, 61 Church Road, Leyland. I would like to invite Janice Crook to present the report. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> so this application relates to um, a detached residential property at 61 Church Road in Leyland. So the site's mainly uh, in a mainly residential area. So you can see from this slide that there is a bowling green to the northwest. Um, the Leyland Town Centre lies towards the west. Residential properties are located on Balcarish Road to the north, along here. Um, there's some on Morris Close and Riley Close to the east. Obviously, residential properties along church road either side. Part of the garden area to the application property was divided off and a development of two bungalows is currently under construction. So the proposal is for a single storey extension to the side and a single storey link extension to the rear. So this shows the side extension 
and then the link extension. So there's an existing barn build into the rear with a garage attached. So the red rectangle sort of demonstrates where the link extension will be located. So the link extension will link the barn to the main dwelling. The barn will be converted to a pool house, which does not in itself require planning permission. Uh, the adjacent property at 63 Church Road will not be unduly impacted on by the link extension. And this is reported on pages 137 and 138 of the committee report. So this is the location of the proposed side extension. Um, this side extension will be opposite number 59 Church Road, which has a first floor window and ground floor window looking towards the extension. However, due to the intervening access road, which serves the bungalow development, and the fact that there's a 1.8 metre high uh, fence to number 59's boundary, plus, as you can see in this slide, there's a two metre high brick wall to the application property. It's considered there will be no undue impact and the application is recommended for approval. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks for that, Janice. I don't have any registered speakers. I don't have any members not on committee. I don't have the applicant either, so I'll just open it up to committee. Councillor Mary Green. Yes, Chair, thank you. Um, it's more of a query, really. On page 136, it says, uh, section six at the bottom, or is it five at the bottom? Sorry, five point one. No elevation drawing of the eastern gable will have, which will house the new swimming pool. Assume that there are no planned changes to this elevation, as in effect it is the boundary between our properties. And there's a note on the plans that ventilation for the swimming pool will be installed to meet current standards, but no indication of any ventilation outlets. Is there going to be any sort of detrimental effect with having a a swimming pool if it's on an adjoining sort of boundary wall and will the ventilation be installed in a way that it's not going to go into the neighbouring gardens or anything? It was more of a query really than uh, a comment. Thank you. Can you help me on that, Jones, please? Yeah, as you'll see from the report that that element of the proposal doesn't require planning permission. So the the uh, conversion of the existing building to form a swimming pool doesn't require planning permission. So, you know, that that's why there's no um, elevation drawing and they don't state where the, the ventilation will be. But that wouldn't require planning permission to convert that building to a swimming pool. OK, thanks for that, Janice. Councillor Phil Smith. Yeah, thank you, Chair. That's a fairly straightforward uh, application. This. Can I just uh, uh, move approval? Thanks for that, Councillor Smith. Councillor Yates. Thank you, Chair. Can I thank Janice for a, a short but detailed report and second approval? Uh, thanks for that, Councillor Yates. Um, anyone else on committee? Wish Councillor Hesketh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Providing that they uh, follow the conditions on, at the end of the report, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think it will blend in very, very well, and I will go along with with uh, approval, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much for that. Anybody else on committee wishing to speak? Okay. We've had a proposal and a seconder. We will now go to the vote. Okay. Councillor Will Adams. Four, Chair. Councillor Mal Donoghue. Four, Chair. Councillor James Flannery. Four, approval. Councillor Mary Green. Approval, Chair. Councillor Harry Hancock. Approval of conditions, Chair. Councillor John Hesketh. Appro approval, Mr Chairman. Councillor Mick Higgins. Ms Eagle, Chair. Councillor Christine Melia. For approval, Chair. Councillor Caroline Moon. For. Councillor Phil Smith. For approval. Councillor Gareth Watson. 
For approval, Chair. And Councillor Barry Yates. Approval, Chair. And I am also in favour. Taz, if you can give us a vote. That vote is carried in respect of um, approval with conditions in, uh, in respect of the application, Chair. Right, thanks very much for that. Okay, item number 10 on the agenda. 78, Huff Lane, Leyland. Uh, Janice, to present again, please. Thank you, Chair. So this application relates to a vacant former optician's premises within the Leyland Town Centre boundary, along Huff Lane are commercial properties. To the south of the site are residential properties on Dorothy and Alice Avenues, and a town centre car park is located to the northeast. So the application proposes a change of use to a hot food takeaway operating between the hours of 4 p.m. and 9.30 p.m. Tuesday, Wednesday and Sunday and 4 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. on Thursday, Friday and Saturday. So this slide just shows the application property within a terrace of other commercial properties. So to the rear, there's a, an alleyway um, which is used as rear access, there's bin storage and deliveries and that's used for all the, the commercial premises in along that stretch. So on the opposite side of the alley, there's an information centre to the rear with uh, residential apartments on Dorothy Avenue. And this is the, the rear of the building and there's also residential properties on Alice Avenue. So this aerial view shows the relationship of the application property to residential properties and the town centre boundary, which you can see is marked in blue. And these are the residential properties to the rear. So this plan demonstrates the proposed internal layout. Environmental health raised some concerns that the proposal has the potential to impact on residents in terms of noise and disturbance. Since the committee report was compiled, the submitted order assessment has been considered by Environmental Health, who confirmed um, the suggested filtration unit is fine, but is missing a maintenance schedule, and therefore request a condition for its submission within one month of opening. Environmental Health also request a condition requiring the submission of details of any external plant equip, excuse me, equipment that may be installed in the future. So with these in conditions in place, it's considered that there will be no undue impact on the residential amenity. And it must be acknowledged that this is a town centre location where such uses are commonplace and the application is therefore recommended for approval. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thanks for the report, Janice. Okay, I don't have any registered objectors. Sorry? I don't have any registered speakers. I don't have any members not on committee wishing to speak. It's all right. Uh, do we have the, well, the applicant and or agent wishing to speak? I have a Miss Anita Mears. Good evening. Good evening. I am representing the director of Bella Viesti Takeaway. I am speaking tonight to assure the committee that we will not install any external plant machinery without the prior approval of the council. We also believe that our choice of kitchen canopy will alleviate any potential kitchen odours without the use of an external extractor. Once known, we will also inform the council of any schedule of filter changes. I would also like to mention that the opening of Bella Viesti will not only create jobs for local people, but will also assist in benefiting the local economy. Thank you for your kind consideration. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks for presenting. Okay, I am now going to bring this item into into committee. I have Councillor Will Adams wishing to speak and Councillor James Flannery wishing to speak. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, thank you again to Janice. A, a very good report. I think it's um, again makes a decision quite easy for myself. I think it's um, definitely a benefit to the high street. Bringing a, um, a unit back into use is always good uh, for our town centre, and that should be something that we should be uh, promoting as a council. I think with the conditions set out in the report regarding um, the environmental health issues and the environmental health now state that they're happy with the conditions that are in the report, I'm quite happy to propose uh, approval, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Councillor Adams. Uh, Councillor Flannery. Thanks, Chair. Uh, yes, this application um, reflects much needed investment in the town centre. Um, and looking at the state of the condition of the building as presented, that investment is welcome. Also, from a business perspective and due to the challenges businesses like this are having in COVID, it's great to see people are prepared to invest and take a chance because it's small investments like this which will help us all recover. So well done to the applicant and I'm going to second the proposal. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Councillor Flannery. Chair, can I just... Uh, Certainly, sorry. Janice. Can I just remind uh, members that there was an update sheet that I issued at the time of the last committee meeting with an additional condition on regarding the um, the order assessment because that was considered by environmental health after I'd done the report. So there was an, an additional condition just to, to ensure that um, the developments carried out in accordance with the mitigation measures outlined in that order assessment. Just wanted to remind members that okay, that was the thanks, additional thanks for that. Are you still happy to with your proposal? Yeah, I'm happy with the proposals and all of the conditions set out, including the supplementary. Thank you. Do we have any other members on committee wishing to speak on this item? Councillor Mal Donoghue. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'd just like to echo everything that's been said and uh, I'll go for approval as well. Okay, if nobody else wishes to speak, we can go to the vote. Okay, Councillor Will Adams. For. Councillor Mal Donoghue. For approval, Chair. Councillor James Flannery. For approval. Councillor Mary Green. Approval, Chair. Councillor Harry Hancock. Approval, Chair. Councillor John Hesketh. For approval, Mr Chairman. Councillor Mick Higgins. For approval, Chair. Councillor Christine Melia. For. Councillor Caroline Moon. For. Councillor Phil Smith. For approval. Councillor Gareth Watson. For approval, Chair. Councillor Barry Yates. Approval, Chair. And I am also in favour of approval. Chair, that's a unanimous vote for approval with condition on that application. Okay, thanks very much for that. We now move on to item 11. Penwitham Arts Centre, the venue, Liverpool Road, Penwitham. Uh, Janice Crook again. Thank you, Chair. Yes, yeah, so this application relates to the former library building on Liverpool Road in Penwitham. The area is a mix of residential and commercial premises. The former government, government buildings are currently being redeveloped as Tesco Supermarket and the district centre lies to the west. So this slide just shows the, the general area. <clears throat> so the application is retrospective for a change of use from the library to an arts centre known as the venue. The proposed use includes cinema clubs, music recitals, arts and craft events, history talks, poetry, sing-alongs, dance sessions, um, and performing artists on a Friday and sat or Saturday evenings. The hours of use applied for are 10 a.m. until 10 p.m. every day, although the building will not operate to the full extent of these hours. For example, the building is currently closed on a Monday and with regular events taking place between 7 p.m. and 10 p.m. on most days. <coughs> It is noted that the premises licence has been granted for 8am to 10.30pm Monday to Sunday. However, 
I'm checking the clerk to the Penwitham Town Council has confirmed that the hours applied for on the planning application are those that they wish to operate. So this slide just shows the, the area um, looking towards the district centre and the crossroads junction of Liverpool Road with Cot Lane and Priory Lane and then commercial properties are on the opposite side of Liverpool Road. Then immediately adjacent is a residential property here, with further residential properties to the rear on Greyfriars Drive. So environmental health did raise concerns that the proposal has the potential to create noise and disturbance to neighbouring residential properties and therefore they require a condition to ensure that the mitigation measures as outlined in the submitted noise impact assessment are fully implemented and then evidence is submitted that they have been included. So this photograph shows the relationship between the application property and the adjacent residential property. It's considered that with the mitigation measures in place and with the inclusion of other conditions requested by environmental health, as reported on pages 148 and 149, there should be no undue impact on the neighbouring residential properties. Thank you, Chair. OK, thanks for that, Janice. Well, we did have Councillor Keith Martin wanting to speak, but he must be having technical issues. He's, he's not joining the meeting. Uh, I haven't got any members not on committee wishing to speak, applicant or agent wishing to speak, so I'm just going to bring it straight into uh, committee. Councillor, which one's first? Councillor Adams. Sorry, Chair, I was just going to uh, raise a point that uh, I too am on the uh, Town Council. Um, so I know that's obviously been raised by Councillor Hancock. Um, about it being a personal interest and not a prejudicial interest. Um, just a query really about um, paragraph 8.2.11 uh, about the where it says alternatively it may be possible to arrange for ventilation via the front north facade of the building um, but then in in the uh, recommended conditions in recommendation 2 it says all doors and windows shall remain closed um, and just for, I just want some clarity in terms of how we can possibly have ventilation via the front, but then have all windows and doors closed. Yeah, that that's reporting from what the mitigation measures are within the report. And then the conditions are what environmental health have, have uh, recommended. So obviously the mitigation measures that they're talking about um, secondary double glaze in, in, in sealed frames. And then they're talking about the, um, the windows and doors to the east, south and west facades of the building remain closed in the event of amplified music. But the actual conditions, what what has been recommended by environmental health, you see. So one's reporting on what the mitigation measures are within the the report, and then environmental health have recommended the conditions. Is that not clear? Sorry. <laughs> um. So does. So I presume then with the condition two that. I don't think we will be able to have the ventilation via the front no. north of the building. No, it doesn't appear so from what environmental health have advised. OK, thank they, you. They'd have to come up with some sort of mechanical ventilation, but not necessarily from what they proposed. So they can't, so, yeah. So for instance, they can't have the front door open that goes on to the main road. Mm. But. The, the closing of the windows and doors is only during the, the times of music entertainment. It's not all the time. <laughs> Councillor Adams. 
Thank you. Um, is that consistent with the um, other properties? I know that we can't take other um, properties into consideration. No, I'll just deal them with this application, Councillor Adams. Okay. Thank you. I'll uh, I'll come back to you. Okay. Thanks for that, Councillor Flannery. Thanks, Chair. It's it's a similar point, but just put it, it's a bit different, but it's similar. On the I, I would well, first of all, I'm going to uh, propose approval. But just can we just quickly just check this condition too? Where, it, as Councillor Adams has said, it says all doors and windows. But two sides of that property, one's a main road and the other side's a new Tesco. So I don't know how closing those windows are going to affect any, any issues in terms of noise. But I'd also just like to factor one more thing in. As we're coming out of COVID, we're getting encouraged to create more ventilation in buildings. So if they're not having any detrimental effect to residents, i.e. facing a main road and a Tesco, I understand why the other two sides need closing, but maybe the, can that condition be revised, whereas we have two sides of the building windows closed, but the other two sides open, which would help with the COVID issue. But also, I don't think it's having any detrimental effect on noise on a main road in Tesco. Would that be okay? Chair, yeah, sorry. Yes, so what you're proposing is to amend the condition that all doors and windows on the east, south and west facades of the building remain closed during events involving and specify those those facades. Yes, yeah, where the residents are, but the non-residents areas keep them open because that will help with ventilation, natural ventilation, which is what we're yeah. being encouraged to do post-COVID. Yeah. I'll uh, bring in Jonathan Node. Yeah, thank, thanks, Chair. I guess what we don't know is whether that would be acceptable with environmental health. Um, it's them that's recommended the condition, so um, that, but whether if, if if environmental health were aware of of that as a proposal, they may well object to it potentially. And we don't know that situation sat sat here tonight. Um. But therefore, just for, for, for progressing the issue, can we approve it? And just a, with a review of review of condition two, and then you know. Can we... Yeah, Taz, Taz would like to come in on that one. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, no, we couldn't actually approve it and then review the condition. You'd obviously be approving with the condition. So um, it seems to me as though that this is perhaps something that could be deferred um, to basically get environmental health's views on it, if that's yeah. a way forward. Jonathan. Yeah. Th thanks, Chair. I mean. It, it can be approved with this condition on, um, the, the applicant could come back and amend the condition at a later point um, as well, or as Taz says, it, it could be deferred to, to consider this for, further, so there's a, a, a number of options there, really. Councillor Yates. Thank, thank you, Mr Chairman. Before I start, could I ask uh, who owns the, does the can we even town council own or lease the building? Uh, Janice, do we know? Yeah, they, they've signed certificate A, so presumably they own the building. In that case, it's going to be not somebody on that committee that should have put an interest in and left the meeting. He shouldn't be speaking. He's, uh, he's gone against the rules of the council. Let's uh, say no more about it and just remove that person, please. You want me to carry on, Mr. Chairman? Are you going to answer that? I, no, I'd just like I'd just like clarification on who you wish to be removed. If he doesn't, Mr. Chairman, it's illegal. Is it can uh, it can be a police matter? Uh, Taz, would you like to come yeah, in? Yeah, I think I think um, in terms of what you're saying, Councillor Yates, it would be helpful if you could confirm who, you, who you're referring to. Uh, well, the council spoke before and said that he was on the on the on the Penwithan Council, but uh, was, didn't declare a pecuniary interest. If the council, if Penwithan Council owns the building or indeed leases it, he has a pecuniary interest. It is public money we're talking about here as well. Um, if I could step in, Councillor Yates, um, as far as the, there are three members of the planning committee who are members of Pemberton Town Council, not just one. 
Um, now, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm aware, they have no personal interest in this matter. They, or rather, they have a personal interest in the matter which has been declared. I don't think they have a, a, a pecuniary interest. The, the way I'd explain it is, for example, in the past, this planning committee has determined applications from South River Borough Council. Uh, but nobody ever suggested any councillors of South Riverborough Council had a pecuniary interest in those applications. You know, um, like, so I don't think the members of Pemberton Town Council have a pecuniary interest. Arguably, they have a personal interest and th those interests have been um, declared. But I don't think there's anything to stop them from taking part and voting in the, in, on the application. OK, thanks for that, Dave. OK, Councillor Yates, you may continue. Councillor Yates, you're muted, which is quite pleasant, but you are muted. Right. I, I just sounded like you last year, last week, Chairman, <laughs> probably. <laughs> uh, anyway, what I'm just saying is I don't, uh, I don't take the, our officer's advice, legal officer's advice on that, because this is a public building that was sold to Penwithan Parish Council um, to... Uh, when, when the Labour administration and Liberal administration, Lancashire County Council, uh, closed the library and then sold it on to Penwithan. So the, it is a, a, an, an interest, and if it doesn't get, I, I'm not making this a threat, but I think it, we'll have to look into this legally after this meeting because it needs reporting to the police if we carry on. Uh, just to clarify that matter. But I will carry on from now, and the members can carry on if they wish, or face the consequences maybe after. Um, what I'm saying is that I do agree with the arts coming into here. I think it's it's a fantastic uh, site for them. Uh, but what, what I do, do disagree with is that there's not a library in the, the building is closed on a Monday, and we should be we should be uh, putting a library in there for one day. What I want to ask is because it's it's looking like we're going to defer it on the environmental outside. Is has it been out to consultation because it's which rate payers money that we're play, we're playing with here? We're not playing with some you know some of these money that uh, it's just floating around. This is a building that the Labour Administration at Lancashire County Council sold to Penwitham for the benefit, and it was a, really it should be for the benefit of the people of Penwitham and the people of South Ribble to have a library and have some facilities like this art centre as well. So I think it's, uh, it, it's completely out of order to carry on with this until it's been looked into. And I would uh, advise, Chair, um, well, can't say advice. I would re recommend to you that we do defer it now until these things are looked into. I'll leave it at that for now, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Yates. Uh, Councillor Mrs. Mary Green. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, um, on reading this report, th thank you for the report, by the way, for the work of the officers. Uh, on reading this report, um, on page 50, it's categorically clear, policy H1, protection of health, education and other community services and facilities, specifies that development proposing the change of use and or loss of any premises and or land currently or last used as a community facility, including community centres, village church halls, place of worship, and public houses will only be permitted where it can demonstrate that the use no longer serves the needs of the community in which it is located or the use is no longer financially viable and it has been demonstrated through a marketing exercise or such process agreed with the council. I challenge that Higher Penwortham doesn't need a library. For a start, the schools, high schools in the near vicinity that would use a library on coming out of school, etc. A library isn't as well just for borrowing books. A library is a place for the community to use with IT facilities, 
some of the libraries have little job centres in there or help applying or or do IT courses or children's clubs in the morning where parents can sit with children and the librarian or parents have the facility to read stories to the children. I mean, the library is multifaceted and multi-use on different things. Already the loss of that library was a great disaster, which was a disgrace actually uh, to the local councillors. Um, they did nothing about it, but that was a loss, a great loss. Yes, it's been stood there empty for a while, but I feel that that building should incorporate at least some, if not all, library facilities. Your nearest library is on, King, on Kingswood uh, Drive, practically six miles. Which elderly person or families with children in pushchairs or whatever can walk six miles to use a library facility? For a community like I append with them, and I shouldn't need to tell the councillors about this, they should know this, a library in this sort of area is essential and necessary. And also the fact that on numerous pages in this report, page 149, uh, page 151, page 152, it refers to noise, it refers, otherwise it wouldn't say that windows and doors have to be closed on egress and ingress. So there's intimation that there's going to be noise, there's going to be disturbance, there's going to be bother. In, a, in, a, in an area, yes, there's shops and there's bars and things, but there's also residential. There's Greyfriars Avenue close by residential, uh, as we've seen on the plan. So to me, I am for refusal or if it's considered deferral is more applicable to get more information to see if the council could, the town council could incorporate library facilities and I don't mean a couple of shelves with the IT equipment shoved in a cupboard like it is in, in a hall on Cop Lane. Uh, there on Cop Lane there is a, a, a hall what, pe what community use but I've seen the library in there, a Priory Lane, is it Port Lane, a Priory Lane it could be, the one opposite uh, on the junction where you come off Liverpool Road and turn down down the road. I've been in there and I've been shown the library. Two shelves of books, two shelves and the IT equipment is stored in a cupboard away from public use. Now you're telling me that is a, a thing that's not needed in that area. So I definitely would like to propose refusal or if not going forward if there's deferral, if there's means of by deferral that we could get a library facility of some sort in there, well I'd be up for deferral but otherwise Definitely refusal. Thank you. Yeah, can, can Councillor Green, can you give us your reasons for refusal? Thank you. S sorry, Chair. Um, yeah, I gave the reason on page 150 at least, if the officers can find more, I dare say, but it's contrary to policy H1 that they put in the con consequently that it's got to be demonstrated that the use no longer serves the needs of the community. Well, I think I've demonstrated there is a, a need for the use of this for a community. So at least contrary to policy H1, this development, and I dare say there'll be others uh, that the officers can find. I mean, there might be parking problems um, and existing built up areas, etc. You know, but the officers will know more about that than I do. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Green. Janice, did you want to come back on anything? No, Councillor Flannery. Thanks, Chair. Wow. Um, whilst I um, whilst I personally was in, in, in support of any libraries getting closed, the fact was it was closed, the building was empty, and I thought tonight we were considering a change of approval from a retrospective library by name but an empty building into what is now, if Councillor Yates allows me to speak, a much loved community facility used by everyone in the area. So with respect to some of your comments, which is the second time you've threatened councillors on committee with reporting to police. If you want, Mr Councillor Yates, I'll give you my address after this, you can go and do it. So I'm proposing approval. I, I'm, approved, I'm proposing before, approval possible. with conditions and I don't want to hear that kind of threat again. So, thank you, Chair. And by the way, I'm accepting that number two condition. Well, let's see, it's not a threat, I'm doing it now. Uh, 
to you, to you, me. Such behaviour is so coming of you, Councillor Yates. Councillor Adams. Can you say that? I to think it's quite an embarrassment uh, on behalf of the South Hill Council uh, for you to actually be like that, uh, Councillor Yates. We have legal professionals within in the room and they're there for that very reason. To get to the back, back to the matter at hand, um, in terms of closing libraries, I think it's quite rich for a Tory council to tell us the effects of closing libraries. It's due to austerity over the last 10 years that you've had to close certain facilities. So I am not going to be lectured about closing of local facilities in this area, certainly by a Tory councillor. I'm very happy to support this application because I know the benefits that this site has brought to the community. There is a community library on Priory Lane. It has been there for over 12 months. I'm happy to uh, accept condition two um, and move second this proposal for approval. Thank you. Councillor Mary Green. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me to come back. The one on Priory Lane is actually the one that I was commenting on before. I got the roads wrong, but that was the one that I meant that's got two shelves and all the IT equipment's locked away. I don't consider that a library. And seeing as how the, the so much austerity that they couldn't keep the libraries open, we opened them all, we opened them all and we bought all the books and that was Tory councillors. If you must be political and criticise Tory councillors, I think it's disgusting. I would suggest we all calm down. That's what I'd suggest and treat each other with respect. Right, so Councillor Mrs Green, you proposed refusal, didn't you? That's, that's correct, Chair, yes I did. Thank you, Councillor Green. Councillor Yates, you seconded refusal, did you? Uh, I haven't, Chairman, but uh, I will do after I've just spoken, so put my hand up to speak. Um, just to go back onto the comments, I didn't threaten to take the council to court. That That is uh, is incorrect, but if you want me to do, I, I will do. There's no problem with that. Put the record straight to the new councillor on the block that's only just been on the council for a few years. Have a look into the history books. It was Lancashire County Council's Liberal and Labour that closed all the libraries, and within months, of the of the Conservative administration got went in. We reopened them again. The only reason Pembroke Park Town Council has that library is because the the the, the uh, oh, 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 oh. council Yates. No, Councillor Yates, I'll, I'll just move on Councillor now. Yates, I'll mute you if you carry on. Well, that is your privilege, uh, 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 Mr Chairman. Remember, you shall have so don't come to me with that. Um, Turn now, off. Uh, Councillor Phil Smith. Thank you, Chair. I think I better be careful what I say now, aren't I? Um, I don't really. I have issues with it, obviously. Uh, if it was a library, it would be nice. Uh, libraries are good for communities. Uh, but I have to say, um, I know Penwitham very, very well. I've probably been to more Penwitham Town Council meetings than these guys put together, to be quite honest, because I used to go to every single one for year after year after year after year, be interrogated by the local councillors. It was a great fun. Um, there's a comment in in, in the report itself uh, about uh, public car parking in close proximity. Well, I know Pendleton fairly well. There isn't a public car park in close proximity. It, it, the place has a problem with parking. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but I don't think the parking issue or or the other library issue is a, is a reason to turn this application down. I think it would be nice if it was a library because libraries are very, very good for the community. Um, 
but to put the building to other community use, um, I think is it, I think is a good thing, and I think it'd be a good thing for Penwitham. Um, so I think I'll be voting for approval. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor Smith. So I've had a vote for refusal and a second for refusal, but then I've had a vote for approval, a second for approval, and I will take this to the vote and we will be voting on the amendment first. So this is for approval, for approval. Okay, so I will go to the vote. Councillor Will Adams. For approval, Chair. Councillor Mal Donoghue. For approval. Councillor James Flannery. For approval. Councillor Mary Green. Against approval. Councillor Harry Hancock. Chair, um, what already has been said, I'm rather confused over this uh, matter of interest. So at the moment, um, I'm going to speak to the monitoring officer later and I'm going to abstain. Okay, Councillor Hesketh. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, I, I've got mixed feelings in connection with this. Uh, one or two points brought forward in connection with uh, con conditions and so forth, uh, ventilation and uh, and, and that uh, I would have liked to have uh, actually uh, deferred it, but I presume uh, at this stage I've got to refuse. Thank you. Okay, hey, thanks, Councillor Hesketh. Councillor Mick Higgins for refusal, sir. Sorry, Councillor Higgins. <coughs> Excuse me. Hey, thank you, Councillor Higgins. Councillor Amelia. For approval. Councillor Moon. For. Councillor Smith. For approval. Councillor Watson. For approval, Chair. And Councillor Yates. Oh, I thought I was muted, Chair. Um, again. Yes. Reluctantly against. And I'm for approval. Taz, can you give us the result? So the amendment is actually approved. Um, it's carried um, by one, two, three, four, five, by eight votes um, for approval with conditions. Okay, thanks very much for that. Okay, moving on to item number 12, Dumbia Limited, Preston Road, Bamber Bridge. Uh, Chris Sowerby. Thank you, Chair. The application relates to a 0.5 hectare parcel of land uh, within the southern uh, boundary of the wider Dumbia meat processing facility. The M6 motorway is present to the west and the M65 motorway is present to the south. Whilst the built up part of the Dumbia site is allocated for employment, uh, the section of the site subject to its application is actually within the green belt, just down here. The site comprises of an area of grass against the backdrop of built development. 0.3 hectares of the application site is proposed to be planted with native broadleafed woodland. And the proposed building measures 45, uh, 49 metres, sorry, by 25 metres and would be used for the processing of animal hides. Uh, there's the proposed building and this is the area of planting which is from the application site. The design and appearance of the building is wholly agricultural with a height of 6.2 metres to the ridge. The nature of the proposal means that very special circumstances are required to be demonstrated to permit development in the green belt. The outlined case cites economic, environmental and ecological benefits as detailed from the officer reports. 
With the building indistinguishable from agricultural buildings and the shielded location of the site, together with the economic, environmental and ecological arguments outlined, it is considered by officers that very special circumstances exist. The application is therefore recommended for approval subject to the imposition of conditions. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks for that, Chris. Um, Once again, we've no registered speakers, we've no members not on committee, and we haven't got the applicant or agents with us, so I will bring this straight into committee. Councillor Smith. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I think we're all very, very mindful of what uh, Greenbelt is and what Greenbelt's all about. Um, and, um, you know, there are exceptions to, to Greenbelt. Um, they're very few and far between, but but there are. Um, I know this site particularly well. I mean, I've been around it a couple of times in the past many years ago. Um, it is a very successful business that employ a lot of people. Um, and I think it's good for the area. Um, I think the mitigation of the planting is is good mitigation. Um, it's something a building that can't be seen from too far away because of the topography of the the land itself. Um, and I will go along with the officer's report and proposal um, I, I, with, with uh, approval with the, with the conditions in the report itself. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Smith. Uh, I have Councillor Hesketh, Councillor Watson and Councillor Will Adams next. Right, thank uh, you Mr Chairman. Uh, this uh, unit actually employs a large amount of personnel. It's a very important business within the area, especially uh, for the livestock farmers and so forth. And it will be, the update will be more important now than ever when we join Brexit and uh, everything is finalised. So I, I would go along with approval, Mr. Chair, Chairman. I think it's a very, very important uh, development. Thanks for that, Councillor Hesketh. Councillor Watson. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Hesketh has more or less just said what I was going to, basically, obviously, enormous employer. Um, it's very important uh, that we keep jobs, especially at the moment. And um, yeah, I, I think it's a reasonable exception to the rule. Thank you. I, oh, I, I, uh, yeah. Okay, thanks Councillor Watson. Councillor Adams? Thanks Chair. I was just going to say completely agree with Councillor Smith um, and would propose um, seconding uh, for approval if it's not, but it's, I think it's already been done anyway. So I think it's a good application and I think I do like the, um, the mitigation with the tree planting as well. I think that's got to be uh, mentioned. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that Councillor Adams. Councillor Yates? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I go along with this application. Um, th this um, firm has, has grown and grown. You employ over 700 people in South River, uh, so I welcome the application. Unfortunately, we do have to give a little bit of green belt up, but uh, and the officers have covered it, covered the reasons why. So I go along with this. Thank you, Chair. Okay, no other proposals. Okay, let's move to the vote then. Councillor Will Adams. For. Councillor Mal Donoghue. Uh, for approval, Chair. Councillor James Flannery. For approval. Councillor Mary Green. Approval, Chair. Councillor Harry Hancock. For approval. Councillor John Hesketh. For approval, for approval Mr Chairman. Chair. Councillor Mick Higgins. For approval, Chair. Councillor Christine Melia. Abstain. Abstain. Councillor Caroline Moon. For. Councillor Phil Smith. For approval. Councillor Gareth Watson. For approval, Chair. Councillor Barry Yates. For approval, Chair. Chair. And I am also in favour of approval. Taz, can we have the vote, please? Yes, that's the vote. that vote is carried in respect of approval with conditions in respect to the application. That's great. We move on to item number 13, which is land at School Lane and Golden Hill Lane, Leyland. Uh, and Debbie Roberts is going to present this item.
Thank you, Chair. Okay, the site is at the junction of Golden Hill and School Lanes in Leyland. It's a mixed use residential and commercial surroundings and it was approved for the new Aldi food store in May 2019. That's well under construction. The application is to vary condition two to allow for minor changes to the approved scheme. Um, because another a number of other conditions refer to the old plan numbers, they also need revising, but they're detailed in the report. So firstly, we've got replacement of a delivery enclosure with an acoustic fence. That ensures that plans and the noise assessment accord with each other. Um, they were suggested in the noise assessment, but it not put onto the plans last time. Um, the top one is the approved scheme and the bottom one is the proposed scheme. So we're looking at betterment from a noise perspective and environmental health have no objection. We've also got erection of an external lobby. Um, the approved scheme was for just a, a, a canopy across the front of the, the store. Uh, it's an extra addition, additional 19 square metres, but they just want to glaze the canopy that was that's already been approved. Sorry, my teeth aren't working tonight. Um, the, we've got landscape alterations. Originally along the front on Golden Hill Lane, there was a dwarf wall with, with a small set of steps. That's been changed to black railings. Um, typically, we're expecting them to be like the ones on the, on the slide. There would also be high visibility railings in front of the nursery, which is the blue line. And along the school lane edge, there will be a stone wall. I'll show you the, the visual of that in a, section, in a second. There's also a small substation that was all, was missing from plans. Um, that would be in this corner behind the landscaping that's, that's to be retained. This is the proposed wall along School Lane. And as you can see, they've reused salvaged stones from the old Balshaw School um, that was demolished. Uh, they've done something similar on the Aldi on Town Gate. They've used existing stonework from there and it, and it does work really well and just an updated visualisation of what they're expecting it to look. We've had one letter objecting, but that's to the already approved store, not to the amendments. And we've had no statutory objections. All undischarged conditions from the original permission will be carried forward, but Environmental Health have asked for an extra one to consider reversing beepers on company vehicles. And that's condition five on the report in front of you. But otherwise, we'd recommend approval of variation with conditions. Thanks, Chair. OK, thanks for that, Debbie. I don't have any registered speakers. I don't have members not on committee. And I don't have the applicant or the agent. Um, I will open up to committee straight away. Councillor Phil Smith. Thank you, thank you, Chair. I, d I don't think anything that's proposed has a has a an impact on the the local community. In fact, I think um, the uh, stone wall on the side is is an improvement, and I think the railings are an improvement. So I'll move approval. Okay, thanks for that, Councillor Smith. Councillor Mary Green. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, obviously this this uh, application is already going ahead. It's being built, etc. Um, so there's nothing really we can do about that. It's going ahead, but I do feel we should be mindful to the residents who are living there that the conditions we're putting on are strengthened and tightened because those residents are directly opposite a massive building that's nearer the road than what I envisaged when the application was passed. Um, I passed it the other day and it's absolutely imposing. So if we could really tighten on the conditions to make the application more, the development more pleasant, shall we say, for the residents who are living there. Uh, for instance, there's talk of landscaping around this uh, electric station, whatever it is at the building on the corner of School Lane and Golden Hill if that could be really landscaped, and I don't mean one or two sparse trees, I mean landscaped to, to cover it. Uh, and also if some bushes and landscaping could be put in where the main shop is, where it's facing 
that row of houses there, the Tudor, ha Tudor style houses, um, if that could, so that would soften it um, slightly. If we could sort of ensure this happens, because I know this isn't relevant to the present development, but I know the landscaping was promised on the application where Dr. Ecker is for the sake of the residents, and it hasn't happened. There's no landscaping there. You've got to start building opposite residents. And this is what I'm feared for this application as well for the residents that live here. Also, there's no mention. I know this was a separate application, but there was an application came in uh, that I issued concerns about when there was talking of an illuminated oldie sign advertising the shop. And I requested if restrictions could be on times when that was illuminated, because obviously too late at night it would shine in the residents bedroom windows it was agreed but i can't see anything in here so basically all i'm asking for is that we could ensure that these conditions are kept tight especially the ones of reversing vehicles vehicles on site where they're hitched up to refrigeration units etc which are very noisy i believe that was quite a problem when it was down at the other site the vehicles were running uh, with refrigeration units arriving early in the morning and keeping the refrigeration units going, uh, which was quite noisy, obviously, for the local residents. So I'm only really asking if these conditions can be kept very, very tight and ensured that we get the best situation for the residents that are living there. Thank you very much. Debbie, would you like to come back on that? Thank you, Chair. Um, as I've already said, any undischarged conditions that were approved by this committee will be carried forward. Um, a number have been discharged formally by the Council's officers, so it's just the remainder. The additional condition, if approved, will be the one for the reversing beepers, which Environmental Health have asked for. Landscaping around the substation is existing and it was retained on the original permission but landscaping along the golden hill lane was approved by members for refu uh, for removal um and that's still the same the same case we can't revisit that when we've already approved removal of it we can't then require aldi to put more in um this scheme is a much better scheme that, than was orig originally proposed and i think it is a much better uh, visual option for the residents on Golden Hill Lane. Thank you, Chair. OK, thanks for that, Debbie. Uh, Councillor Flannery? Yeah, I want to uh, second Councillor Smith's uh, uh, proposal, please. Thank you. Councillor Watson, did you want to come in? No, I'm fine. I completely agree with everything that's been said. OK, thank you. Councillor Barry Yates? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, everything's been said. I've just took my hand down. Uh, could I thank Debbie for, for explaining uh, the variation? Uh, because that was very helpful. And thank you for your good report. Thank you. OK, thanks for that, Councillor Yates. Anyone else wanting to speak on this item? No? OK, we'll go to the vote. Uh, Councillor Will Adams. For approval, Chair. Councillor Maldonado. Well, reluctantly, I'm going to say a approval this time, but I, I refused it last time. So, so what uh, are you doing this time? I'm going to, I'm going to say approval. Approval. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Donahue. Council. For approval. Councillor Mary Green. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm afraid I've still got reservations on this. I'm not happy. Things still seem a little bit up in the air. So um, I'm voting for refusal. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hancock. Approval, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Han Hancock. Councillor Hesketh. Approval. <coughs> Thank you. Councillor Higgins. For approval, sir. Thank you. Councillor Melia. Approval, approval. Chair. Councillor Moon. For. Councillor Phil Smith. For approval. Councillor Gareth Watson. For approval, Chair. Councillor Yates. Approval, Chair. Thank you. And I'm also for approval. Taz, will you confirm the outcome of the vote, please? Yes, Chair. So that is approval with the varied conditions. Um, that's been granted, Chair. 
Wonderful. Thank you for that. Okay. Item number 14. 71 Bristol Avenue, Harrington, Leyland. Uh, Debbie, if you'd like to present the report, please. Thank you, Chair. Last but not least. Um, 71 Bristol Avenue is cornered property in the existing built-up area in Farrington. Um, the, it's been brought to committee because it's a member of staff's property. Photograph of the front of the property. As you can see, it's got a partial dormer on the front elevation. The proposal is to complete the dormer, so it will be a 1.9 metre wide extension in materials and a form to match the existing. We've had no objections and we would recommend approval with conditions. Thanks, Chair. Okay, Debbie, thanks for that. Um, got no registered speakers, uh, members not on committee, no, and the applicant straw agent, no. So I'm going to bring it into committee and invite Will Adams and then Councillor Smith to speak. Thank you, Chair. Fairly straightforward for me. I think we wouldn't even be thinking about this if it wasn't uh, a member of staff. So I think it's policy complaint. Um, I'm going to move approval. Thank you. Councillor Smith. A second approval, Chair. Councillor Hesketh. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, I'll go along with approval with the other members. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, we'll, we'll go straight to the vote then. Uh, Councillor Will Adams? Four. Councillor Donoghue? For approval, Chair. Councillor Flannery? For approval. Councillor Mary Green? Approval, Chair. Councillor Hancock? Approval, Chair. Councillor Hesketh? Approval, Mr Chairman. Councillor Higgins for Councillor Amelia. For. Councillor Moon. For. Councillor Smith. For approval. Councillor Watson. For approval, Chair. Councillor Yates. Approval, Chair. And I am also for approval. Okay, Taz. Thank you, Chair. So that's a unanimous uh, vote in respect of approval with conditions on that one bit. Uh, thank you. Okay, thanks everyone for attending this evening. Um, it's been eventful a bit, and I wish you all a very, very happy Christmas and a peaceful one. Okay, good night, and thank you for attending. Thank you. <laughs>